Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The International Space Station is a workplace, but it is also a home. And like many homes, the residents get together to watch television. But what are the technical challenges involved with delivering television 350 kilometers above the surface? But before I go into the details, I have to say, this portion of my video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some top-notch filmmakers and creators. If you're anything like me, then you spend a lot of your time trying to stuff knowledge into your brain, and documentaries are a great way to fill in spaces in your day or in your brain. You can be sure that I've already spent a lot of time checking out the service. There's plenty of full-length space documentaries covering all the things that I like to talk about, but the things that I find myself watching are the fields where I still have a lot to learn. Biology, archaeology, history. Heck, the last thing that I watched on there was a documentary about baseball pitchers throwing knuckleballs. Yep, I, you know, I'm always interested in new things. Curiosity Stream was founded by John Hendricks, who was also the founder of the Discovery Channel. But instead of having to pause your learning experience to watch the ads, your membership gets you uninterrupted access to their extensive catalog. The service is available worldwide and it runs on just about any digital video delivery platform you have access to. So, here's the deal. You get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. But for everyone watching this channel right now, there is a special deal where you can get a 30-day free trial if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash scott. Or you can use the promo code scott during the sign-in process. So give it a shot because there's lots of things to learn on there that I'll never be able to teach you. And once again, thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this portion of the video. Anyway, on the International Space Station, Astronauts very quickly got their entertainment systems figured out. Based on the logs of Bill Shepard from Expedition 1, the first movie they watched on the International Space Station was The Sixth Sense, using a laptop playing video CDs which had been delivered on a progress shuttle. Apparently, The Sixth Sense was chosen by uh, Yuri Gidzenko, who thought it might be a sequel to The Fifth Element. I mean, I can understand, it has Bruce Willis and it has a number in the title. Movie time became a regular feature for the crew, with the movie titles being logged alongside the occasional commentary on the quality. But video CDs are kind of crappy quality. For those that don't know, they're equivalent to about 320p quality videos on YouTube, with the added hassle of having to swap discs roughly halfway through your typical movie. But DVDs did arrive on STS-98 with a small stock of discs and a pair of space-certified portable DVD players. Now, what exactly is a space-certified DVD player? Well, lots of consumer devices that go to space have to get modified before sending them there. Usually this means replacing the power system to work on international station power. Uh, the batteries are usually not going to be certified, so those are replaced with a, something that will be. Sometimes I've seen iPods running on AA batteries. Also, glass screens are a terribly dangerous thing to have in space because if they break, the fragments float around until they typically get in somebody's eye or even worse, lung. And for space, DVD players also have the problem of region locking. It is an international station after all, but region free players were in a bit of a complicated position legal wise in the US, what with the DMCA making it illegal for NASA to actually region unlock a player. So instead they actually got the players from a British company known for region unlocking the gear and they also did the other modifications to the hardware and they sent a couple of DVD players with those modifications. And the station logs show that they quite liked them. They also give us some clue as to what the first movies might have been. Um, you know, Full Metal Jacket, Austin Powers 2, The Green Mile, Usual Suspects, The Hurricane, and a documentary about the Navy SEALs. And the best part I noticed is that there was one moment where they had to move the Soyuz from one docking port to another, and that involves lots of waiting around as pressures equalize. So while flying the Soyuz, they were watching Austin Powers 2. Over the years, more discs would come to the space station. Astronauts would be able to request deliveries and they would go up on the next appropriate launch. 
And there's actually lists of the discs though, with the movies and the shows available thanks to FOIA requests. I think in 2016 there was about 500 discs on the ISS. Uh, one disc that did come home was a copy of The Right Stuff, which had been signed by most of the cast and major crew members. However, these days the station has moved over to digital viewing. Downloading content, or rather uploading content because the space station is up there, right? The first mention of this is, I think, 2009 when the ISS crew got to see Star Trek without having to wait in line or come back home. Uh, this was about the same time they got proper internet access and TJ Creamer was able to post the first unassisted tweet from space. When asked about the internet in space, astronaut Mark Kelly commented that the access is very similar to dial-up. However, we know that the system is actually able to deliver real-time video so they can watch things like the Super Bowl. So it's actually way faster than dial-up, it just feels like dial-up and there's a reason for that. For most of the time, the ISS is communicating via something called the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRIS, which is a series of satellites in geostationary orbit that look down on satellites in lower orbits and relay their transmissions to ground stations. It's not just the International Space Station that uses that, but satellites such as the Hubble Space Telescope, Landsat, JPSS, and many other spacecraft. Also, apparently the US military and intelligence services made extensive use of this network to deliver data back to Earth. Long ago, before TDRS was a thing, NASA communicated with the crews via the Manned Spaceflight Network, which consisted of a bunch of ground stations spread all around the world, and these could relay the signals back to mission control via landlines. Communication was only possible with the station when it was above the horizon, so they would have limited windows to get the data back. And it was not uncommon for crews on missions to spend long periods of their orbit out of touch with mission control. During the Mercury program, there were about a dozen stations, but adding more ground stations wasn't always possible. In fact, setting up ground stations required complicated political agreements and as a result they were also vulnerable to shifting politics in their local countries. So in the 1970s NASA began developing a space-based system which would enable a handful of satellites in high orbit to maintain unbroken communications with spacecraft in low orbit. TDRS-1 was launched in 1983 on the sixth flight of the space shuttle. It was supposed to be inserted into a geosynchronous orbit using the interim upper stage, a two-stage solid rocket motor. However, the spacecraft tumbled while the firing the second stage, and the spacecraft ended up in a decidedly non-geostationary orbit. It did, however, have enough fuel in its attitude control system to reach something approximating its final orbit within a few months, and it did begin providing service. Uh, one area where it moved was over the Indian Ocean, where the biggest gap in the coverage was. But to provide worldwide coverage, TDRS needed a second satellite. However, TDRS-2 was the primary payload on Challenger's ill-fated flight, leaving a single satellite in orbit for five years until TDRS-3 launched on STS-26, the return to flight for the space shuttle program. With reduced fuel on board, TDRS-1 was actually also allowed to drift out of its intended equatorial orbit. It remained geosynchronous, but it would move up and down in the orbital plane, far enough north and south so that it actually was able to provide uh, connectivity for facilities like the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. It would actually operate successfully for about 25 years before its hardware failed and it had to be retired. The TDRS spacecraft deployed in space are pretty big. They're about 19 meters across when fully unfolded with two large steerable antenna about five meters across. Uh, these can point at individual targets and they provide KU and KA band uh, a service. They provide hundreds of megabits of bandwidth in this under ideal conditions. In the center, there is an, a, a, an array, a multi-access antenna array, which can support something like 20 spacecraft, but it only develop, delivers like megabit scale bandwidth. And of course, then there's a dedicated downlink antenna that will connect to either the ground station in New Mexico, Maryland, or Guam. And these ground stations, of course, can then connect back via ground lines. There have been a dozen TDRS satellites launched, 
with three generations of hardware. The most recent one was launched in 2017 on board an Atlas V. There's eight of the satellites still active, two have been placed into on-orbit storage, and two have had to retire because of hardware failures. So Tidris is how data gets to and from the space station, and the current versions will happily deliver hundreds of megabits of bandwidth, which explains why the crew can indeed watch the Super Bowl live. Of course, the space station isn't simply connected to the internet. That would be kind of dangerous. There are firewalls, there are air gap networks. And to actually have the astronauts or give the astronauts the ability to access things on the internet directly, they use remote desktops. There is a bunch of computers on the ground which are regular desktop computers essentially that are obviously hardened. And the astronauts have separate computers in space that have their own network that connect via remote desktop and control those. That is why the performance is like dial-up because you'll click the mouse button and it will be a couple of seconds before that finally registers and gets back to you. So the computers on the ground are the ones braving the malware and everything else. The ones on space are supposedly protected from this, although there have been incidents with malware in space. Now that being said, this system is not how astronauts watch movies. They don't browse to their famous favorite streaming service and then watch it over a remote desktop. No, they instead request the content and ground service personnel arrange it and upload it so it ends up on their personal devices. But then you might wonder, with astronauts' famously busy schedules, you might wonder just how much time do astronauts have to sit around and watch TV? Well, turns out that most of an astronaut's TV time is spent during the two hours of mandatory ex exercise they have to get every day. When they're on treadmills, when they're on exercise bikes, they're multitasking, they're watching their movies, they're watching their documentaries, and they're keeping themselves sane. And that gives them a lot of time. I hear that Drew Feustel, for example, he binged the whole of Game of Thrones when he was in space. But when he came home, it, that was before season eight. So he hasn't, at the time we talked about this, he still hadn't seen season eight, which may be a blessing or a curse, depending upon your opinion. So as a home from home, the ISS lacks many of the things that we expect on Earth. But at least they're not missing out on the TV and movies that we're enjoying back home. And I guess the question I have now is, do they have access to YouTube? I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>